Good job. All right, would you guys pray with me? Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for the opportunity for us to gather and to fellowship and to uh, take time out of our busy schedules to invest in, in our marriages. And I pray that you would use Paul and Brooke to speak into our lives, to challenge us, to encourage us, to point us to Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we got, a, we got a pink mic and a blue mic. Okay. Which, which one do you want? You want to do the pink? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll go pink. Get situated here. This is what he gave me. There. Careful, don't fall. All right, I think I'm good. I got now long I'm legs. Now I'm nervous because there's a video camera. Yeah. <laughs> All right, how you guys feeling? Awesome. Why don't we? Uh, Give a round of applause for all those who prepared the salsa and all the food, and uh, awesome job, everybody. Uh, well, of course, this is my wife. I mentioned her uh, this morning, Brooke, and we have been married for 21 years. Everybody can hear us out there, all the way on the back row. It's like, okay. Um, and so our three kids mentioned that a little bit, and, yep. and so, yeah, it's, uh, we met in Fort Smith, Arkansas, at a church I was a youth pastoring at, and... Uh, you want to tell us how we got together? You keep Everybody. looking at me like he wants me to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm everyone. I'm the, talker. I'm the talker in the house. So anyway, we're going to come together on this. Yes. Um, we're very thankful to be here. We love Ben and Estelle. Yeah. We've gotten to know them. I guess last year is when we met Estelle and really connected with them. They're great people. And um, we are really thankful for them in our lives. And y'all are blessed to have them as your pastor. Yeah, put your hands together. Yeah, for they're really great. Um, so we, he was born in New Orleans, right, in Metairie, but I was born in Oklahoma. So I'm an Okie from Muskogee, not from Muskogee. From Poto, Oklahoma, little podunk town there. In fact, our kids thought that we were going to Homa, Oklahoma. <laughs> they thought, I said, no, like, it's Louisiana. You're in Oklahoma? It's, it's, my, it's my part of the country. There's New not Orleans, a Homa, Oklahoma. Yeah, so there's not. Yeah. But we met in Arkansas, and then shortly after that, we moved to Texas. Yes. Do you want to tell them how we met? Well, it was uh, a little bit scandalous. Uh, I was her youth pastor, and she was in the youth group. Yep. And yep. Uh, no, it actually was above board, but that's kind of, I had to wait for her to get out of the youth group in order for me to uh, go on a date uh, with her. And so that's so that I happened. laugh at Got those the blessing of our pastor and uh, he gave the green light. Yeah. So it wasn't scandalous, yeah, but so I laugh wasn't. because he has with, the, you know, that if you were here this morning, you heard about the ham on the neck story and the date. He has multiple stories of bad dates and I was like that was God just keeping him for me till I grew up and then we could meet yes. and um, get together but but yeah we've been married 21 years and it's been a, a great a great marriage I think um, you know as all we've tried to center our marriage on Christ and on the Bible and um, there's ups and there's downs and but God has always brought us through and he's faithful and it's been a it's been a ride Right. Yeah, so someone said that it takes uh, two to have a successful marriage, and uh, I was doing some pre-marriage counseling here recently, and I said it takes three uh, because it's the Lord. And it's not just inviting the Lord into your marriage, it's inviting the Lord into the center of your marriage and the middle of your marriage. And so uh, the foundation of having and on the road to a thriving um, marriage, I think the goal would be communication. And so we want to talk about how to talk because it is the, the area or the category that could be a potential breakdown. Mm -hmm. Finances is one, sex or lack of sex is another one, but finances actually is at the top of, if there's some sort of, that has to thrive as far as relationships. Someone said, if you do uh, communication right, uh, you do relationships right, that's, that's how you can do life right and marriage right. And if you have kids in that way, it's, it's on the basis of or the foundation of communication. So uh, with that, we just want to talk simply about uh, a thriving marriage. I think that uh, marriage is friendship on fire. 
I think you have to start with a basis of friendship, uh, but there has to have some, uh, some salsa spice to it. Uh, it has to have some uh, caliente uh, on it. And uh, to keep those fires burning for as long as you are married and the Lord has joined you together, uh, it is on the basis of we've got to perfect this art of good quality communication uh, with one another. And so what you have is, of course, as all of you know, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, and then it's the communication or the slithering in of the serpent communicating to this wife yeah. that began the ruin, that began the breakdown. So the lack of communication or the wrong communication coming into our ears, into our lodging, into our spirits can cause separation uh, between the husband uh, and the wife. And so it's, it's a critical uh, issue. It's disruption in the force if we don't have communication uh, right. The good news is that the goal of God is always to get us back to the garden. And so even though there may be some disruption and the communication is not great, um, the word Eden actually means uh, enjoyment. It means pleasant, a pleasant place. Uh, it means a happy place. It means a beautiful place. It means a well-watered place. And so if we are not in that space as it relates to our marriage, wherever that marriage may be, because of a breakdown, uh, the goal of God is to get us back to that garden-like living. I, I love the book of Nehemiah because Nehemiah comes into something of a state of ruin. For 123 years, the walls are broken down. And how many know God can turn that thing around? In 52 days, he can do a restorative work yes. and begin to start building back what has been broken down. And so we want to just guard ourselves against bad uh, communication and or wrong communication that comes into our hearts. Yeah, so today we're excited to talk with you guys about this, about communication. And we're going to go to the book of Malachi. Um, it's, the, of course, the last book in the Old Testament. And if we're... I, when I was younger, I used to think it was Malachi. Now, that sounds Italian, right? It sounds romantic. <laughs> Malachi, the Italian prophet. But um, anyway, so in the book of Malachi, it gives us um, right ways to live. And, and in, in fact, in chapter 2, it talks about, you know, how to steer clear of, of you know, treacherous ways and ways that would lead to destruction. And so we're going to give, give some truths out of Malachi 3, and we're going to start in verse 16 and read um, a couple verses here. It says in verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And so we're going to give you some T's. How many of you like that when it, you, know, you can remember things well? So we're going to give you four T's and to help you have a thriving marriage as it relates to communication. And so the first T that we're going to talk about is talk. <laughs> it said in verse 16 that they talked with each other. So we have to talk. It seems really simple, but I think a lot of our misunderstandings, our um, friction comes from a lack of communication. At least it does in our lives. And not just in a marriage, but in relationships in general. How many times have I talked to a friend and I'm like, is there something bothering? Yeah, you said this and I misread it. Or, you know, we just sometimes don't communicate well or we don't communicate enough what we're feeling, what we're thinking. And so it's so important that we talk one with another. And so um, that's what we want to talk about is how we talk. And I, uh, I came across this story and there was a couple, they were from England, and they, um, the wife would make bread almost every evening for dinner, homemade bread, and she'd have the kids around the table, and she would cut the bread, and she would give, you know, all the kids, like, bread from the middle, and always gave the husband the ends of the bread. What do y'all call them around here? The heels? 
He, is that from Oklahoma? Heels, like the like heel. The heel. I'm sorry, I'm an Oki, and it comes out on some words. And uh, the what do you the butt? Yeah. The I, butt that's butt. what I said, yeah, and he was right. like, "What? What's that?" Yeah. The crust. Do what? Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> is that the Spanish word? Yeah, oh. Right. No. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> the ends. Asian French word for the crusty ends. Okay. And so she would give those to her husband, and he hated it. But for 30 years, he ate that part of the bread and just harbored an annoyance and started getting bitter every time because she would serve every time, and he never said anything about it. Finally, after 30 years, he was fed up, and he said, why do you always give me this part? This is the worst part of the bread. And then once he cooled down, she said, when I was growing up, our father treasured that part of the bread. He thought it was the best part, and so whatever kid was the best behaved would get that as a reward. So all of these years, I've been giving it to you because I, I want you to know I love you the most, and I wanted you to feel the most valuable with the best bread. Why didn't you tell me you didn't like it? So, I mean, that's an example of how we just either... We're, I don't know if we're afraid of rejection or if we just don't know how to communicate what we're feeling, but how it can just store up and store up, and it's a complete misunderstanding. It was actually an act of love and kindness, but he thought she was giving him the leftovers. Well, he's trying to hold a grudge, and she's trying to be a blessing, but yeah. they're, they're missing one another, not tuned into one another for years and years because they just simply didn't have a heart-to-heart -heart and just begin to start breaking down and saying, let's talk about this. Uh, and it would have been uh, so much better in that way. So how many are talkers in the house? How many are, you're just, you're the talk, there's my, there's all my people right there. And, uh, and so, uh, I, of course, that's, that's me. Out of our five, Joel, our oldest, is an introvert. Uh, Brooke doesn't talk a whole lot, but all the rest of us make up the difference. In fact, we won't shut up uh, with, with things. And uh, Jen is a talker. Liam's probably the most as far as talking. And everybody's talking in the house. Nobody shuts up. But with that, uh, talking brings a, uh, a unity. It brings a sense of um, God in the home and God walking through the house as he talks to us. And he's our example. But I, I love how it talks about communication is connected to unity. Psalm 133, verse 1 through 3, it says, How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And it's not just good. Good is good, but pleasant is better. How good and how pleasant it is for, uh, for a family or for a marriage to dwell together with unity for what? God commands blessing because we're celebrating one another. We're bragging on one another. We're defending each other's weaknesses and talking with one another. And the communication is on the same page. So here's an exercise for us uh, here today. I'm going to ask for you guys to start clapping and then just begin to start on three. And when you begin to start clapping, just clap until I tell you to stop. Okay, you guys ready for that? Three, two, one, just start clapping. Keep going, keep going. Oh, 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 oh. okay. There you go, there you go. They're starting to get it. <laughs> That, uh, that's it. Okay. So it took a little while, but anyhow, but, it, but what happens is there was a, there was a unity because some of you guys were going faster in the beginning, and then some of you guys were going slower, and then all of a sudden there comes together this sense of everybody's clapping together. And there is that, that meeting in the middle or that compromise that has to happen. There has to be some, I'm not going to slow down my clap to get unified with other people. I'm not going to speed up my clap in order to get on the page with everybody else in the room. So there has to be bend. There has to be blessed are the flexible for they shall remain standing. That's a, a, a beatitude that I just made up. Anyhow, but there has to be a flex or an agility with one another and a compromise. If one in the marriage wants to have sex seven times a week, but the other one in the marriage never wants to have sex. No, just kidding. So if the other one in the marriage wants to do it once a week, there's going to be some not unity or there's going to be some built up grudge or frustration on why one is not getting it more than they ought and the other one doesn't want to do it as much. So you have to come together, as Pastor Jimmy Evans says, and get your Batman on. So anyhow, you have to, maybe it's not one and maybe it's not seven, but maybe it's something in the middle 
or if that's on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or however. But you got to talk about some of these things. One of the, y'all have probably all gone through the five love languages. Mine is affirmation and affection. So I love for her to tell me that she loves me and touch me while she tells me and how awesome I am while she loves me in that way. And hers is serving. I have a bubble. I yes, a bubble physical broke. Physical bubble. So, uh, like, I'm not a touchy person. So I, I like to cling. I, I like to bust to, it. I, I like to cuddle, and she goes, "Your legs are very hot. They're like radiating fever uh, off of you." And I just like, I just want a spoon. And so she said, "I don't want a spoon." And so we got to talk about spooning and how all that comes together. Uh, and so her thing is is serving. And so I got to lay down my life. In fact, marriage is a funeral as well. It's not just friendship on fire. It's I got to die. I got to die to my ego. I got to die to it's a funeral of my selfish needs and what I want and tune into, right, to what she wants. So it's amazing. I can give her a gift and she can say, thank you. That's awesome. I could give her, I could give her 40 roses and she's going to say thank you, but it's not the gift of giving. That's not what resonates with her. But if I start dusting the blinds, if I start serving her or doing something that it's like even when she doesn't ask me to do something and I die to what I want to do and I begin to start tuning into and saying I'll vacuum and she doesn't tell me to vacuum, when I'm dusting blinds, she gets that look in her eye and I'm like, this is going to go well. <laughs> Heaven is gonna, have, heaven's going to come down and meet earth uh, right now, and she's going to want to spoon uh, t- tonight. And that, so you don't do it for the purpose of spooning, but there is a benefit, fellas. And so what you get is outside your box and meet in the middle to bring some, does that make sense? Like to bring some unity and some compromises to that. you got to bend. Yeah. All right. Well, that <laughs> yeah. segues well. I am well the talker. I said I was the talker. talker. Yeah. Into uh, point number two, which is tuning. And notice uh, we read it in, in verse 16. It says that God listens and he heard them. Do you know there's a difference between listening and hearing? Like we can hear things, but we don't always listen to the things. We're not tuned in to what people are saying. I think one of the best advices I've ever received is that when you're in a, like when you're communicating with your spouse, maybe it's a disagreement that we always want to be understood. You know, that's our natural thing. We want you to understand. I want you just to hear my point. But what what was told to me was seek first to understand, then to be understood. Because if he and I are both trying to be understood, then we're not really understanding each other. And so we have to seek to understand where they're coming from, what um, their angle is, and then we can say, okay, I understand, but this is how I see it. And the, if the other person is trying to understand, then we can come together and have some resolve in the situation. Um, we have to bend, like he said, and we have to be willing to lay down um, what we think things should look at because you could win the battle and lose the war. And we, this is for the long run. We want, this is a marathon, not just a sprint. We want to run this race well, and we want to do it together. And, um, and so what that takes is compromise. And it takes, you know, being patient with each other and actually listening to needs and being aware of those needs instead of just thinking about our needs all the time. Yeah, and um, so when I think about, like, scripturally, like Genesis 18. Abraham was a talker. Yeah. Um, he was a grunter. He was a <laughs> talker. Um, in Genesis 18, nine times, it says he was in a hurry. Yeah. He was in a hurry to, to meet those people's needs. The angels showed up. He was in a hurry. He was in a hurry for ministry. He had drive in him. Um, there was a pace in him that he was always... He had something to do as it relates to work or, or ministry. And, but the pace with Abraham was, was out of control. It was OOC, out of control. He was a visionary. He was a driver. Of course, Sarah was submissive. She was a listener. She was sweet. And, but as it relates to communication, Abraham was talking over her. He was not thinking about what Brooke was talking about, being understood or understanding or listening 
uh, in that way, which led to uh, a breakdown because there was someone that came up to Abraham, and you see this because he's, he's killing it. He's killing it in every category of his life except for his wife. He's in a hurry. He's in a hurry. He's in a hurry. He's in a hurry. He's just he's, he's going awesome in all in work, ministry, pace, all that kind of stuff. But someone comes up to him and says, where's your wife, Abraham? Genesis 18. And he goes, she's in the tent, which is a typical dude. Not in tune at all to crushing it in every other area of his life. Where's your wife? Uh, Physically, she's over there in the kitchen, I think. She's at at the house. Locationally, she's in the tent. Notice how, how short he is with, he's fast with everything else. When it comes to the things that are most important as it relates to marriage, ah, she's over there. Well, what is she doing? Have no clue. Don't have a clue what's going on. Well, Abraham, can you tell me where she is? We're not asking you physically where she is in the tent. Anybody can say that. Where is she emotionally? All right, let me try this side of the room because I don't know if I got a good good response. Where where is she spiritually? What's what's going on inside of her that you can bring out and pull out greatness and pull out significance because you're having conversations? You slow your life down to make those things that matter the most important, which which is marriage. He prioritized everything else. His pace was out of control. Did not prioritize the pace of his marriage to slow it down, to have a conversation on the couch and say, where are you? Where are you, Sarah? Really? Let's talk about this. We have to make this, this work, right? And so when we come together, there's sometimes that Brooke will just literally say, uh, Paul, you're, just, you're focused, you're laser-like, uh, you're doing good in all these areas, but we haven't sat down and talked about, we've got to talk about finances. We've got to talk about the kids. Oh, I need you to kick in, and I need you to discipline the kids because I've been doing all the disciplining. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that you began to start sharing that because I would not have known. Do I have ears to hear what the heart cry of Brooke is so that I can kick in and help her? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So it, it, it's two equals one. It, it's, yeah. We're better together in that way. And when we're having conversations, uh, digital detox. I mean, shut it down. Sh- shut down the, in fact, we put phones in the middle of the table. We go to eat at a restaurant, phones in the middle. Like, let's just, let's, let's tune in to, to one another. Let's have a, com- a meaningful conversation with Joel and Jenna and, and Liam, because why? If I'm, even if I'm there and present, I'm not available. I communicate a devaluing or a disconnection if I'm there in proximity, but I'm disinterested, I'm uncaring, I'm unavailable, even though I'm in the same living room, I'm not in, in tune with, and God wants better for that. Amen, everybody, for that. And so, anyway, that's what the scripture teaches us as it relates to tuning in. Well, I remember a season in our marriage um, several years ago. It was a hard season. It was a busy season for his, I was a stay-at-home mom serving at the church. We weren't senior pastors yet. We were, you know, we were on, he was on staff at a, a larger church And it was, the pace was really fast. And I remember, I, you know, I'd be with the kids all day when, this was when they were little. And he would come home on the phone and continue to work. And, you know, and it's like five, six o'clock. And I just need a break. (laughs) You know, I'm like, and, and it would just irritate me when he would walk through that door on the phone. And and it just, it caused like this wedge. And finally we came together and I said, look, please yeah. do yeah. not walk in the house on the phone. Even if you have to sit in the driveway and wrap up that conversation, because what you're doing is you're like, well, I'm leaving work, but I'm not really leaving work. And I need you to be present. I need that from you. And so, and for a while you didn't communicate that, but I would just be upset. And so I know? had, as a guy, I just had no idea. I'm just He's coming like, I'm in. Home. I'm on the phone. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm home. What's up? You, you pat the kids or whatever, and then you're back on the phone again. So it's like until she said something, I just would have been a, totally a, oblivious to what was going on. Yeah, so that's very important is that we communicate the things that, 
that are bothering us. And so, okay, let's move on to number three. The third T is the tone of our communication. So here's a definition of tone. It's the quality of a person's voice, the quality of a sound produced by a musical instrument or singing voice, a quality, feeling, or attitude expressed by the words that someone uses in speaking or writing. Tone is so important. How many of you have teenagers? <laughs> You're raising teenagers. Yes, we've got two of them. So you know, as a parent of a teenager, that they can say the right thing, <laughs> but if they have this attitudinal tone, then it's just like, they're saying, you're like, hey, will you take out the trash? Oh, uh, yes. You know, then you're like, oh, no, uh-uh. <laughs> Let's have a little talk here. The tone is so important. I believe that Jesus didn't only say what he heard his father say, but he said it with the tone of the father. He represented the heart of the father. Um, and Jesus was gentle. He, um, you know, he could get fired up when he was, you know, flipping tables. But he was mostly, he had a tone of compassion. He had a tone of love and grace. I mean, think about how he's talking to the woman at the well, how he was talking to the fishermen, come follow me. He, he had a life-giving tone. And I think it's so important that our tone in our home is life-giving and it doesn't we're not being sassy with each other or or because I know like when I'm frustrated or tired I can be short I can be snappy and and that just tears down those walls and of trust and so I we had this um, lady that we used to work with and she was over pastoral care ministry at the church, you probably remember Karen Douglas, and and so she was wonderful. You know, helped oversee all of the pastoral cares that relates to, you know, prayer needs and taking care of of people in you know when they've lost loved ones or had new babies, all of that. You know, just caring hospital visits and all of that. So she would. Um, this was back when texting was like you know, taken off, <laughs> and it was like the actual words and emojis started becoming popular, and she thought that LOL meant lots of love, and so people would email her or text her, hey, I'm really struggling, can you pray with me, you know, or um, my husband is sick in the hospital, yes, I will pray for you, LOL, <laughs> and, and like she didn't understand, the, the people were like, responding oddly to her and so finally someone sat her down and said look you're telling people you're laughing at their shortcomings and problems that they're having in their life it means lots of laughs so please stop using lol but that's just a funny illustration but we can misunderstand that and not know how our tone and and, and texting is big because we we may not mean it a certain way. We just shoot off a text because we're busy, but it's hard to read tone in text. So sometimes if it's something, um, you know, a sticky situation, I don't text it. I'll pick up the phone and call him because I'm like, I want you to hear my tone on this, but I need you to do this, you know. <laughs> and um, I think it's really big to watch how we talk to each other. Hey, we're just keeping it real. Uh, so anyhow, Psalm 101, 1 and 2, it says, I'll be careful to live a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with a blameless heart, and holiness adorns your house. And so like what Brooke is talking about, the atmosphere or the tone in your home. And so with that, Jesus was very generous with his words. In fact, those who accused Jesus of how he communicated, who weren't even on the page with Jesus, would say, look at the gracious words that come out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. The second thing would be, look at the authority in how he speaks. He does not speak like the other scribes and Pharisees or teachers of the law. So there was an authority, there was a weight, there was an authority in how he talked, um, but there was a, there was a graciousness. Yeah. So we want our words to make impact. It says of Samuel that every word that Samuel spoke, it penetrated. Not one word fell down to the ground. Yeah. So there's, there's an authority that's established. There's a weight or an impact with our words. They're not meaningless when you are having a conversation, but it's, it's filled with gentleness or it's filled with grace. And so the atmosphere of your home, 
or the tone of your home needs to have faith. It needs to have hope in it. It doesn't need to have the tearing down or the breaking down. It needs to have the Ephesians 4.29 says the building up for, et, for godly edification is how we speak to one another. Seasoned with grace is what the book of Colossians talks about. And so I'm going to improve your sex life right now. One of the things that would happen if you were to come home and have a conversation with your wife because your tone is not tough, your tone is, is tender and gentle. It, it'll do wonders in that particular area is, guys, if you say, and then what happened? <laughs> and then what happened? How many know that'll improve everything as it instead relates like, to, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm, instead yeah, of like, oh, uh, and, hey, how was your day, Brooke? And she says something, and you're, you're out to lunch. <laughs> if I'm leaning in and I ask her a question, and then I'm listening to what she has to say, and then I say, and then what happened? Please talk more. <laughs> yeah, that, that's going to bring another, how many of that brings another level of heaven into your home right there. And so it's the atmosphere of your home, putting away of the temper, putting away of the tough, in fact, the outrage of our kids and our, our spouse will remember us in the extreme verbal moments. And it's, it's a triggering mechanism that happens. Like, in other words, our, our kids will know when we're absolutely silent and we're not, like, Dad never talks at all. He's never engaged, never, never puts his voice on anything. And the other extreme where it's when they do talk or when Dad does talk, uh, well, the way he talks to Mom, it's just, it's like bombs going off in Baghdad or something. It's like, let's get ready to rumble. It's like they our kids. So we're scaring the kids by not being tender and gracious with or generous or having a large heart with our words that comes out of our the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? So we're not just scaring the kids, we're scarring the kids in that way. So it's very, very critical and important to to tame that and to temper and, and to bring meekness, which is strength under control. We tame the tongue is what the book of James talks about. David Youngie Cho, you may know uh, of him. He um, pastored the largest church in the world, uh, like 800,000 people in his church in Seoul, Korea, maybe a million people, so- something like that. And he tells the story at pastor's conferences about his uh, two pastors in a very honest and vulnerable way. And, and he says, this is where I failed. He said, I was in a hurry all the time. I'm building this, my kingdom, really. I'm, I'm building this huge church, and I'm missing it at home. I'm missing it with my kids. I'm missing it with my wife. And so he shares very honestly with tears in his eyes. And uh, he says, there's one particular story where, uh, he said, I was just constantly in such a hurry, my pace, I was just, I was burned out. And so with that, when you're burned out, lots of times you begin to start burning, burning other people with your words. You're angry or quick-tempered in that way and quick to anger. And so he would, uh, he would be ha- he said, I- I'd just be happy. I'd be, I'd be so glad. I'd be so happy in front of the people on a Sunday morning smiling and talking to all the people. And, of course, his family's observing this for, for many, many years as the church just continues to, to grow. And, and, uh, but then he would come home and burn his kids with his words. He's, he's grouchy. He's, he's grumpy. He's angry. Uh, so, anyway, one of the days at the office, he went one particular Monday after a Sunday where they had a, a great Sunday and he was there all happy and talking about rejoicing in the Lord and praising the Lord. And so the next day, his whole family came up to the office and he says, what are y'all doing here? I'm working. And he said, and, and what do you have in your hands? And his wife and his kids all had their sleeping bags and their comforters and their, pil- and their pillows. And they said, well, we don't like the dad that comes home to us. We like the dad that's the minister who's all happy up on the stage. So we figured that we would bring home from home and bring it up to church to be with happy dad. Hello. And you talk about, and that's, 
that was the response when he was sharing with pastors because it hits you in a way to say we can't we can't continue on this path of the way that we communicate it's got to be in a thriving way lord help help our hearts and how we say what we say to our family and that's what was happening in Malachi. The, the priest and, and the leaders, they were burnt out, so they were burning people. And God had to come back and realign them. And I love what it says in, in verse 16 at the end. It talks about a book of remembrance was written. And if you think about that, what kind of book would be written about the atmosphere of your home, the tone of your home? Would it be a thriller? <laughs> Would it be a drama? Would it be a love story, a, a novel? Would it be um, a comedy? You know, I, I think I want the book of remembrance to be that of love and life and joy and, um, you know, where God is the center and God, you know, where the Bible is spoken a lot in our home. And, um, and so it's important what we share and what we say in front of our kids, you know, I think sometimes, you know, our home is our safe place, right? So it's our place to, we talk honestly and, and everything with each other about frustrations or about people in our life. And, and, and this is a safe place. But if our kids are hearing us, maybe at the dinner table in front of them, gossiping about people, um, maybe belittling authority figures in our life, pastors or, or whoever, if, if your boss is mistreating you and you say, they, they pick up on that. And what happens is we wonder why our kids don't respect authority, but maybe we set that tone in our home unknowingly. You know, those conversations aren't necessarily bad to have, but maybe not in front of the children. That's not the best place to talk about, about that. And so, um, that sets the tone, that sets what type of book, you know, we're going to be written about our home. And so we want, we want to guard that. We want the kids, of course we're not perfect, of course we're going to make mistakes, but overall as we look back after we've raised our children or maybe you have, you know, you have grandkids or whatever, you say, what are they going to take away from when they're spending time with me? Is it, is it life and love and joy or is it, something else so that's very important yeah i think it's one of the things that kept moses out of the promised land is that he he took that stick and instead of speaking to the rock he starts beating the rock and he's he's complaining to god about the people Mm -hmm. that he's supposed to have a heart for and care for and pray for and lead and shepherd with integrity and here he's 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 chiding against the he's He's burned out, and he's burning the people. That's what's happening in Malachi chapter 2 is that these priests, they're on the edge of divorce, and God's having to rebuke them because they're just going through the routine of going to church, the routine of life. They're offering sacrifices. They're just doing this and doing that, but there's no life behind it. There's no energy or motivation or the life of God in it. And so they're just, they're just doing life. They're just buzzing through life just nine to five and coming home and it's just kind of the same thing there's no sense of vitality that can happen or significance that can happen in a marriage they're just going through the rut or the routine of life and and they begin to start then burning uh the people i I love in acts chapter 4 and verse 36 as we begin to wrap it up here um it, it says of of barnabas and we know of barnabas his name means son of encouragement but he wasn't named Barnabas. His, his name was actually Joseph. His name was, or Joseph, e- either one of those translations. But because he was so encouraging, the Christians around him renamed him, you're not Joseph anymore or Joseph anymore. You're the son of encouragement. We're going to slap a new name on you. Your name is Barnabas because you're so encouraging to people. And that's, that's what we're talking about here today, that there would be some sense of you survey your, your family or your kids, because that's where the real truth comes out, is that is there a sense of affirmation uh, in the home, affection in the home? Uh, or if we do blow it and we're not encouraging, do we send a text or have a conversation with our kids and say, we just, I'm sorry, Joel, I just, I blew it, man. I might have said the right thing, but the way that I said it to you, I, I just want to tell you, Dad, sorry forgive me. 
is there is there a humility in that to go to our kids and just say, I just want to be honest with you, man. I, I was just out of control. I went over the edge with that. Can you forgive dad for that? And so often my, my flesh doesn't like it. My pride doesn't like it. But often I ask Brooke, how can I be a better husband? I ask her that all the time. Now I'm going like this. La, 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 la. <laughs> like I don't want to hear what she has to say. But I trust her, and I know that if she's going to tell me something that I don't want to hear, it's to make me better because yeah. I trust her because we're in this thing together. Amen, everybody. And so we want to be, incur- we want to be like Barnabas to, to our family and our, and our kids. All right. Well, the fourth T and the last T is the treasure, and that's what he's talking about is that, that encouragement. And it says actually um, in this, it talks about that he will, he said that they will be mine in the day that I will make them my treasured possessions. So this is above and beyond. This is not just, we're not trying to survive any longer. And, you know, there are those seasons. But it's like, this is the bling. <laughs> Y'all like a, some bling? Mm-hmm. Uh, Texas ladies like a lot of bling. <laughs> but it's, it's what, what brings fun into the marriage, what brings life and joy is we talk we compliment each other. We encourage each other. Um, there's large doses of, yeah. of love and doting over one another. And, and I think that's important because we're not going to, we go in the world and, and get hit and, and badgered sometimes where, wherever you work. And then home needs to be a place where you're encouraged and, and that you, we believe in each other. And, like, we, we don't just do, like, oh, yeah, I believe in you, but we tell each other we believe in each other. And um, I think it's, it adds a little sparkle to your marriage just to not just, oh, yeah, you're great, this and that, or oh, I told you I love you when we got married, but, you know, <laughs> large doses of encouragement, and, and that will help it, you know, help your marriage. Well, we are better together, and in that I think about, she partners with me in ministry, and so where I'm a big fat zero, she's a she's a perfect ten, and I I need her. I need her gifts, and that completes me. And it's not a competition thing. Um, and I'm strong in some areas, and then we come together, and not just with our family, our kids, but as it relates to the ministries that we we lead in our church. And you know, Mary and Joseph had a dream, and that was to to birth Jesus. And, of course, there was the woman who played that part in, in birthing. But notice it, it says that Joseph named him, mm-hmm. right? And so the, the woman gave birth to Jesus, but it was Joseph who, who put his voice on it and said, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And so that's, that's very important that we put, um, we're just going to, we have to come to a place where we break the silence. Like, put the name of Jesus on your kids. Like, go in there and just don't hurry up like Abraham. Like, like prophesy over your kids. Pray the pain off the wall over your kids and your family and your wife. And grab her hand and treasure her. And say, you're just as much of a part of this ministry and this household as I am. And appreciate that and affirm uh, those gifts. And so, is it an, an, an environment of the life of God to where it's there's laughter and there's fun and your kids can come up and kiss you. My dad was was making me kiss him when I was 14 years old and six foot three and he had a big beard. And I was like, I had my friend over, sleeping over, and he goes, I don't care if your friend is here. You come over here and you put a kiss on me. I mean, I saw mom and dad. I mean, he's making pancakes every single Saturday morning, eggs and bacon and all the stuff and and he's just, he's kissing mom in the kitchen. I mean, there was just, he was goofy as all get out. He loved Jesus with all of his heart. He was a pastor in New Orleans. But there was just a sense of just joy in the house. And God wants to deposit a large dose of joy and to get the joy back and get the passion back because we're better together in that way. You want to add anything more? Yeah, enjoyed that. <laughs> it's a te- it's a testimony. It's a testimony. Marriage is a testimony to even the world of between Christ and His bride, and uh, 
the Lord, the Lord showed me one, one day. He said, you're not going to be able to take care of, of my bride, meaning the church, if you can't take care of yours. And I remember going to the office one day. This is just for free because it's off the page. But I, I remember going, just to be honest, uh, I remember going to the office on a Monday morning after preaching on Sunday. And uh, we had some aggressive fellowship on the way, uh, too. And I, and I just kind of, I got to go to the office. And like, okay, we're, we're going to have to talk about this particular, I forgot exactly what it was. but Isn't that the thing? You always forget what it was about. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I went to God's honest truth, as God is my witness. I, I get to the office. I get behind my desk. I put my Bible on my desk. And I'm getting ready to prepare to preach the, the next Sunday or prepare the next sermon. And it was like the heavens shut closed. And I, just, I felt this impression from the Lord. I'm not talking to you until you pick up the honking phone and talk to your wife. It's not happening. You want to get some kind of heavy revy? You want to get some kind of revelation for next Sunday and want to do the ministry? And get into this routine and until you get this thing reconciled or this thing restored or healed, I'm not talking to you. I just felt like the Lord was just saying, like, boom, get it right. And then I'll talk to you. But get it right with her. Because if you're going to take care of my bigger bride, my bigger church, you're going to have to take care of her. And God just, he drops those little, those, he nukes us with, the, how many have ever been nuked by God? He just drops those grenades on the table like, okay, this is going to bring some chiro, spiritual chiropractic adjustment yeah. and realignment that I need. Thank you, Lord. And so in that case, I, I could rise up in pride and, and just kind of motor push through that and power through that in my flesh and have zero anointing when I go before God's people. Or I can go ahead and make it right as it relates to the priorities in the home. Because it does start with God. And then it starts with your eternal uh, relationship, personal relationship with your wife. And then third, it's your kids. And so we tell our, we literally tell our church, you're number four. <laughs> you're not number one. We, ha we have to guard this. And I'm not going to make ministry a mistress. That's not going to happen. That's, that's out of priority, and it's out of decency and order, as it says in Corinthians. And so I've got to have this right at the home, and then God opens up the heaven. Amen, somebody. And then he blesses, and then you're a voice to a generation, and you put your voice on people that you're supposed to minister to. But it's got to start with the ministry that starts right here, with praying with one another, affirming one another, celebrating one another, each other's gifts. And then we do it, we do that together. And so we want to uh, simply... Can we just pray for y'all? Is that, is that okay? And just bless you guys uh, here tonight. Let's just go ahead and bow our heads uh, this evening. God, we just invite you into this story, your story of marriage. And we want you in the center, not just in our marriage, but in the middle of our marriage. Lord, we know that your first institution of a marriage was in Genesis, and then your first miracle in the New Testament was around the wedding of Cana, where there were some issues. There was, some, there was a problem. There was a failure of wine. But you were invited into the middle of that, that wedding, and you turned it all around. And God, you can turn, transformationally, you can turn water into wine. And I, I thank you, Father, that you can make something fruitful. And I just pray, God, that we would, Lord, get back to what you want us to get back to, and that is garden-like, Garden of Eden-like living. Help us, Lord. Forgive us, we pray. God, help us to communicate to one another. Help us, Lord, to get onto the road of having a thriving marriage. I thank you, Lord, that you can restore and reignite in just a moment. I thank you, Lord, in the book of Job, it says even a stump, a tree stump that is cut down, and looks like there's nothing there at all, but yet at the smell, just at the little smell of water, all of a sudden tender shoots will begin to grow again. And I don't know, Lord, what marriages are in this room. I don't know where they are circumstantially or the situational dynamics in this room, but maybe there are those who feel like 
Nehemiah's wall. It's just kind of, it's in ruins, it's smoldering, it's smoking, or maybe an oak tree that's just cut down. It looks like there's no hope at all, but God, you can inject hope into it at the smell of water, at the smell of the Holy Spirit moving and inviting you, Christ, into our, our marriage. God, we can begin to grow and begin to call it blessed. And I thank you, Father. Would you just help us, Lord, that we can get our passion back. Lord, we can get Christ back in our home. We invite him back into our house to walk into our living room, walk into our master bedroom, walk into our bathroom and into our kitchen. And Lord, we want the atmosphere of Jesus, Lord, to permeate and to penetrate every part of our lives. Help us, Lord. Come on, why don't we just extend our hands right now and just, just ask the Lord to help you right now. God, we need your strength. Lord, where there's massive deficiency, there's massive sufficiency in the Spirit of God. We don't want to operate according to the flesh. Lord, we want to stand strong in the Spirit of God and just pour in and just fill us once again, Lord, with your power. Give us wisdom, Lord. We don't have to come up with new strategies or tactics. We just have to come down with it. And it comes down from heaven. There's wisdom that resides on the inside of our hearts on how we can lead our homes, lead our marriages, lead our kids for your glory. And as for a testimony of Christ in the earth, God, help our marriages to be strong. Let not the enemy slither in and deceive us and bring destruction to us. But God, you have given us abundant life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen to that. Hey, we love you guys. Y'all are awesome. Thank you for having us. What an honor. Was it wasn't that first class? Wasn't that amazing? Thank you guys so much for coming and sharing. Amen. All right, so I guess this is the moment. You know which is which? Hey, so this is the last chance to vote. Anybody not voted? Anybody need to put more pieces of paper in my bucket? All right. Sorry, right, Matt. Go ahead and do a count if you know which is which. All right, so, um, yeah, we're going to sit tight for a second and uh, wait for Matt to get his hands crossed and make sure he gives me the more, more of the votes. Do we have any salsa music? Did we? Did you line that up, Manny? So Chuck, Chuck's up there with some salsa music, or you got it back here? Oh, okay. Right. Matt's got the salsa music. I know which cup was yours, and I'm looking a little nervous. Now I did see some smaller papers in mine, so I could have a lot of smaller papers folded up. I'm not confident right now. Yeah. All right, Matt, I'm going to give you the mic. You get to make the grand announcement. All right, here we go. This is the moment of truth. All right. <laughs> it's very close. Okay. By a margin of only four votes. Only four votes. And the winner is... This one. Manny Vera, the winner. Now I have to give me a second to key up the uh, salsa music. You preached better than me, Ben. It was good. It was good competition. I got nervous. I was, I, I I was a little nervous. Close. I was looking at your container. I thought, man, you got double the votes, but there's only four. They voted for you first. Yeah. So what are we going to do? We're going to dance. <laughs> you going to teach me how to salsa dance? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to dance with you. I hate that. Oh. <laughs>
on that note, <laughs> hey, thank you guys so much for coming out. So somehow I know that an end of the year review video is going to have that somewhere. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Paul and Brooke, again. It was wonderful. Hey, uh, tomorrow night, uh, Paul and I are going to be doing a Q&A. We're going to talk about um, men and how we can be who God's called us to be. So tomorrow night at 6.30, dinner starts in the, in the fellowship hall, and then 7 o'clock, we'll have the Bible study. Amen? God bless you.